I've been talking to physicists, cosmologists about their work, but I also like to push them on what's the meaning, the deep meaning of what they do. And we've had fascinating conversations, and I, I really am passionate about learning. I, I have this sense, and it's ill-defined, that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence can help us understand the meaning of cosmology as well as are there extraterrestrial beings, that there's a, a deeper meaning that can be discerned from the search that, that, that you do. Am I off base or, or is, that, is, this, is this something there? I think there, there's something there. I, one of the things when we talk to young children and look for our replacements, right, um, we, we talk about this concept that we are made out of stardust. We are intimately connected with the cosmos, right? right? And so the question is, are others as well. And I think that if we were to find one answer or the other, it would help us to understand the nature of the laws that govern this cosmos. Uh, I, I like um, Jill's response because you talk about cosmology really in, in a broader sense than we often do now at the 21st century. I think we often have this dichotomy of either there's physical cosmology or philosophical cosmology. Sort of uh, what's the ultimate nature of reality? What's the nature of time? Is the universe eternal? Right. But you're also talking about what is the meaning and how do we relate to this broader cosmos? You know, I, I think we should think of another kind of cosmology yet, yeah, something you might call a cosmology cognitive cosmology. Uh, so how would a being who is differently constituted than we are conceptualize the universe? There's the possibility that if we do make contact with another civilization, they can provide a radically different view of how this whole cosmos is constituted. Um, so that's one way that there could be a profound cosmological impact. Um, of course, it could be simply uh, going beyond what we know because they're more advanced philosophically, more advanced technologically than we are. A, a, a very simple question is in the search, is the frequency of extraterrestrial right. intelligence. Uh, I mean, the, the boundary conditions are we're the only one, and it's extremely frequent, whatever that may mean, and then obviously everything in between. But those that positioning, which I would think we would be able to set certain boundary conditions as you do more and more work, uh, even a negative result will, will create the likelihood in terms of its frequency, will reflect on what the laws of physics do in terms of, 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 of biological requirement, which is a very contentious issue. Is the production of life completely capricious and totally accidental, or is it somehow built into the laws of physics where it's almost inevitable under certain conditions? I mean, those are radically extreme conditions. No one has the answer to that. That's right, and and it, one way of thinking of it is is a, like a branching ratio in physics, right. where there exactly. are multiple outcomes, and with enough experimentation and enough data, you can begin to understand the probability that you will take one branch versus another. And I think that's... One of the things that we're asking of the universe, how often does chemistry lead to biology? I think radio astronomers are, um, uh, we're, we should be chastised for talking about this wonderful poetry of the organic chemistry among the stars, and then immediately deciding that that has something to do with life on Earth. And the process, the details of how those organics, those large molecules we do see in space, how the amino acids from that we find in, uh, in meteorites, how in detail do those turn into life on this planet? Or is there no detailed connection? Does the chemistry get reset totally in a young planetary system? And the outcomes have little to do with what went on before. This is real data that will be accumulated in the coming decades or centuries or whatever it happens to be. But this is not, this is not po theoretically possible. This will actually be done. That's so correct. those boundary conditions, uh, choosing the branching, narrowing the conditions, constraining the answer one way or another, even if there's no 
ultimate answer, but you're constraining the answer. Is, and, so, is and, and depending upon the phenomena that we're looking at, we're going to get those answers sooner. So the, the critical thing is how long is it going to take to get the data? You know, as a psychologist, I go into the lab, I gather some data. I can expect within a few weeks or a few months, I'm either going to support my hypothesis um, or I'm going to refute it. We don't have that luxury. You've got to be more patient in your career. You have job. to be much more patient. You know, and in that sense, um, any science is also not just trying to be objective about the nature of the cosmos, but it's, it's uh, uh, perpetuating a certain set of values. And I think patience is one of the values that SETI. Well, we're, we're not just patient. We're going out and proactively trying to train our next generation. Of, but, we're of say, but we're saying um, we may not get the answer in our lifetime, and we may well need that next generation or the next generation or the next generation. And we're hopeful that maybe the answer is going to come tomorrow. But there, but if we don't get an answer, if we don't get a signal, it's wide open. You, you have to plan for both uh, That's right. extremes, getting That's the right. signal tomorrow or not getting the signal for multiple generations because you just you, you have to continue uh, in order to go forward. Well, we plan for success. We have the champagne on ice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it's getting better with age. No, well, <laughs> somehow it doesn't last. Oh, we keep you really take a bite. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, well, um, if, if you look at the, at, at, at the current galaxy, our Milky Way, estimates 100 billion to 400 billion stars, the number of planets planetary systems that uh, stars have seems in, in recent years, as we discovered more and more extrasolar planets, seems to be increasing in terms of the percentage of stars that do have planetary systems from what we thought prior. And yet, if you look at estimates in terms of the number, uh, the estimated number of other intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, they are still at, at vast extremes from literally multiple millions or tens of millions. I, I don't know what the upper number is that some people estimate, but certainly the lower number is that there may be one other or, or maybe we're alone. And, and th there's a very wide variety. I mean, current thinking is uh, what, what is the upper limit that at least Intel, some intelligent people think may be the number of, of civilizations in our galaxy that, that, that could that we could have intelligent life. Well, actually, I'm the wrong person to ask that question because I'll tell you the answer after we make a detection. I don't know what the answer is, and it's the the big uncertainty is basically the number of such civilizations is within an order of magnitude comparable to their longevity in years. We have no way of bounding that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a technology could could. Have some natural uh, 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 inhibition to longevity. There could be a natural result of beings that grow up through evolution, which seems to be a universal principle of evolution and com competition. It's a universal principle, and technology amplifies the competition between creatures. I mean, civilizations could have short lives. I mean, or if in fact technology leads to a machine intelligence that might in fact. Uh, get away from some of the biological uh, aggressive aggressions and problems of, of resources, perhaps then technology is extremely stabilizing mm -hmm. and they turn into long, long-lived civilizations. And of course, as we talk about the lifetime of civilizations, we mean in practical terms the lifetime of civilizations in terms of are they transmitting. So there may be very long-lived, stable civilizations, but if they're keeping to themselves, if they're not trying to make themselves known, then we won't detect them in SETI. So there's an additional complication. It's not just do they continue to exist, but do they have the motivation to make contact with us? As I look at the question that, that, that I want to focus on, which are the implications for cosmology, and asking the question, does the work that you do have real uh, impact on understanding our cosmos. By the way, if it doesn't, what you do is still have tremendous validity in terms of understanding what's going on. But, but I, I think I have the sense there's something more in there. And, it, and that something more is, is regarding the fundamental laws of physics that we have in our universe. Do they, by their very nature, have something built into them in a, in a, in a trophic way that kind of pulls it towards some biological systems or, or, or some systems of intelligence, biological or not, or whatever it happens to be? I mean, that, that's a question that I'm wrestling with. But you're also asking a question in terms of the laws of physics. And I would ask a question of whether there is necessarily one unified set of laws of physics. You know, I believe that we in extraterrestrials have this physical reality in common.
But it's not at all clear to me that all scientific models of that same shared reality are necessarily the same. So again, we may be able to get a much deeper understanding of the cosmos by understanding a different species way of conceptualizing that same shared universe. Yeah, look, that, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I think I think that's tease apart two things of, of what, what you're saying. One is the laws of physics themselves, might they vary from one place to another? We seem to think they're relatively constant that's from right. what we see. They may differ in multiple universes. It doesn't seem like there could be communication with multiple universes, but who knows? You know, maybe in some way they, they can be through super advanced civilizations can figure out a way through the speed of light. Who, who knows? But then your point is that from how can you, uh, another species may take the same laws of physics and look at it in a very different way. You know, the philosopher Nicholas Rescher makes a great point. He says that an aquatic extraterrestrial may have a very sophisticated science of hydrodynamics um, that we humans don't have because we don't have this immediate need to understand an aquatic environment. Now, when you start getting to those creatures that can communicate at interstellar distances, there it seems you have more commonality of interest. But in terms of the initial world of an organism that uh, evolves in a very different environment than mm -hmm. ours, we could potentially learn something different about some laws of physics that make sense once we understand it, but we never thought about investigating. That's why I have this just this sense that, that there's something out there in what you do that can really reflect deeply on the nature of the cosmos and the laws of physics. And I think it's, under, it's easier to anticipate what that impact would be if we really do detect something out there. If we continue over the course of hundreds or thousands of years and search but don't find anything, I think from where we're positioned right now, we're in a very difficult position to contemplate what that means. So much about cosmology will change in the course of those hundreds or thousands of years that it's very difficult to make any sort of predictions about the implications of not detecting ET.